Good evening. I hope everyone is doing well this Sunday. <laughs> you can tell I'm good at days of the week. I always remember them. Um, as you can, I think I mentioned last time I cut my hair. If you weren't here last time, surprise, I cut my hair. <laughs> and yeah, we started reading Flatland, a romance of many dimensions last, uh, last episode. So we'll be continuing with Flatland today. Uh, we had read through part one, section six. I don't know why it's, it's got a very weird chapter structure that I think is supposed to be reminiscent of like a textbook. Uh, yeah, so we will be continuing. I'm going to get a sip of water real quick. Section seven, concerning irregular figures. Throughout the previous pages, I have been assuming what perhaps should have been laid down at the beginning as a distinct and fundamental proposition, that every human being in Flatland is a regular figure, that is to say, of regular construction. By this I mean that a woman must not only be a line, but a straight line, that an artisan or soldier must have two of his sides equal, that tradesmen must have three sides equal, lawyers, of which class I am a humble member, four sides equal, and generally that in every polygon all the sides must be equal. The size of the sides would, of course, depend upon the age of the individual. A female at birth would be about an inch long, while a tall adult woman might extend to a foot. As to the males of every class, it may be roughly said that the length of an adult's sides when added together is two feet or a little more, but the size of our sides is not under consideration. I am speaking of the equality of sides, and I it does not need much reflection to see that the whole of the social life in Flatland rests upon the fundamental fact that nature wills all figures to have their sides equal. If our sides were unequal, our angles might be unequal. Instead of it being, its being sufficient to feel or estimate by sight a single angle in order to determine the form of an individual, it would be necessary to ascertain each angle by the experiment of feeling, but life would be too short for such a tedious groping. The whole science and art of sight recognition would at once perish. Feeling, so far as it is an art, would not long survive. Intercourse would become perilous or impossible. No one would be safe in making the most simple social arrangements. In a word, civilization would relapse into barbarism. Am I going too fast to carry my readers with me to these obvious conclusions? Surely a moment's reflection and a single instance from common life must convince every one that our whole social system is based upon regularity or equality of angles. You meet, for example, two or three tradesmen in the street whom you recognize at once to be tradesmen by a glance at their angles and rapidly bedimmed sides, and you ask them to step into your home to lunch. This you do at present with perfect confidence, because everyone knows to an inch or two the area occupied by an adult triangle, but imagine that your tradesman drags behind his regular and respectable vertex a parallelogram of twelve or thirteen inches in diagonal. What are you to do with such a monster sticking fast in your house door? I am insulting the intelligence of my readers by accumulating details which must be patent to everyone who enjoys the advantages of a residence in Spaceland. Obviously, the measurements of a single angle would no longer be sufficient under such portentous circumstances. One's whole life would be taken up in feeling or surveying the perimeter of one's acquaintances. Already, the difficulties of avoiding a collision in a crowd are enough to tax the sagacity of even a well-educated square. But. If no one could calculate the regularity of a single figure in the company, well, all would be chaos and confusion, and the slightest panic would cause serious injuries, or, if there happened to be any women or soldiers present, perhaps considerable loss of life. Expediency, therefore, concurs with nature in stamping the seal of its approval upon regularity of confirmation, nor has the law been backward in seconding their efforts. Irregularity of figure means with us the same as, or more than a combination of moral obliquity and criminality with you, and is treated accordingly. There are not wanting, it is true, some promulgators of paradoxes who maintain that there is no necessary connection between geometrical and moral irregularity. The irregularity, they say, is from his birth scouted by his own parents, derided by his brothers and sisters, neglected by the domestics, scorned and suspected by society, and excluded 
from all posts of responsibility, trust, and useful activity. His every movement is jealously watched by the police till he comes of age and presents himself for inspection. Then he is either destroyed if he is found to exceed the fixed margin of deviation, or else immured in a government office as a clerk of the seventh class, prevented from marriage, forced to drudge at an uninteresting occupation for a miserable stipend, obliged to live and board at the office, and to take even his vacation under close supervision. What wonder that human nature, even in the best and purest is embittered and perverted by such surroundings. All this very plausible reasoning does not convince me, as it has not convinced the wisest of our statesmen, that our ancestors erred in laying it down as an axiom of policy that the toleration of irregularity is incompatible with the safety of the state. Doubtless, the life of an irregular is hard, but the interests of the greater number require that it shall be hard. If a man with a triangular front and a polygonal back were allowed to exist and to propagate a still more irregular posterity, what would become of the arts of life? Are the houses and doors and churches in Flatland to be altered in order to accommodate such monsters? Are our ticket collectors to be required to measure every man's perimeter before they allow him to enter a theatre or to take his place in a lecture room? Is an irregular to be exempted from the militia? And if not, how is he to be prevented from carrying desolation into the ranks of his comrades again? What irresistible temptations to fraudulent impostures must needs beset such a creature? How easy for him to enter a shop with his polygonal front foremost and to order goods to any extent from a confiding tradesman. Let the advocates of a falsely called philanthropy plead as they may for the abrogation of the irregular penal laws I for my part have never known an irregular who was not also what nature evidently intended him to be, a hypocrite, a misanthropist, and up to the limits of his power, a perpetrator of all manner of mischief. Not that I should be disposed to recommend at present the extreme measures adopted by some states, where an infant whose angle deviates by half a degree from the correct angularity is summarily destroyed at birth. Some of our highest and ablest men, men of real genius, have during their earliest days labored under deviations as great or as or even greater than forty-five minutes, and the loss of their precious lives would have been an irreparable injury to the state. The art of healing also has achieved some of its most glorious triumphs in the compressions, extensions, trepannings, colligations, and other surgical and dietetic operations by which irregularity has been partly or wholly cured. Advocating, therefore, a via media, I would lay down no fixed or absolute line of demarcation, but at the period when the frame is just beginning to set, and when the medical board has reported that recovery is improbable, I would suggest that the irregular offspring be painlessly and mercifully consumed. Section 8 of the Ancient Practice of Painting if my readers have followed me with any attention up to this point, they will not be surprised to hear that life is somewhat dull in Flatland. I do not, of course, mean that there are not battles, conspiracies, tumults, factions, and all those other phenomena which are supposed to make history interesting, nor would I deny that the strange mixture of the problems of life and the problems of mathematics, continually inducing conjecture and giving the opportunity of immediate verification, imparts to our existence a zest which you in Spaceland can hardly comprehend. I speak now from the aesthetic and artistic point of view when I say that life with us is dull, aesthetically and artistically very dull indeed. How can it be otherwise, when all one's prospects, all one's landscapes, historical pieces, portraits, flowers, still life, are nothing but a single line, with no varieties except degrees of brightness and obscurity? It was not always thus. Color, if tradition speaks the truth, once for the space of half a dozen centuries or more, threw a transient splendor over the lives of our ancestors in the remotest ages. Some private individual, a pentagon whose name is variously reported, having casually discovered the constituents of the simpler colors and a rudimentary method of painting, is said to have begun decorating first his house, then his servants, then his father, his sons and grandsons, and lastly, himself. The convenience, as well as the beauty of the results, commended themselves to all. Wherever chromatists, for that by that name the most trustworthy authorities concur in calling him, turned his variegated frame, 
There he at once excited attention and attracted respect. No one now needed to feel him, no one mistook his front for his back. All his movements were readily ascertained by his neighbors without the slightest strain on their powers of calculation. No one jostled him, or failed to make way for him. His voice was saved by the labor of that exhausting utterance by which we colorless squares and pentagons are often forced to proclaim our individuality when we move amid a crowd of ignorant isosceles. The fashion spread like wildfire. Before a week was over, every square and triangle in the district had copied the example of chromatists, and only a few of the more conservative pentagons still had out, held out. A month or two found even the dodecagons infected with the innovation. A year had not elapsed before the habit had spread to all but the highest of the nobility. Needless to say, the custom soon made its way from the district of Chromatis to surrounding regions, and within two generations, no one in all flatland was colorless except the women and the priests. Here, nature herself appeared to erect a barrier, and to plead against extending the innovation to these two classes. Many-sidedness was almost essential as a pretext for the innovators. Distinction of sides is intended by nature to imply a distinction of colors, such was the sophism which in those days flew from mouth to mouth, converting whole towns at a time to the new culture, but, manifestly to our priests and women, this adage did not apply. The latter had only one side, and therefore, plurally and pedantically speaking, no sides. The former, if at least they would assert their claim to be really and truly circles and not mere high-class polygons with an infinitely large number of infinitesimally small sides were in the habit of boasting what women confessed and deplored that they also had no sides being blessed with a perimeter of one line or in other words a circumference hence it came to pass that these two distinction that these two classes could see no force in the so-called axiom about distinctions of sides di implying distinction of color and when all others had succumbed to the fascinations of corporal decoration, the priests and the women alone still remained pure from the pollution of paint. Immoral, licentious, anarchical, unscientific, call them by what names you will, yet from an aesthetic point of view, these ancient days of the color revolt were the glorious childhood of art in Flatland. A child, alas, that never ripened into manhood, nor even reached the blossom of youth, to live was then in itself a delight, because living implied seeing. Even at a small party, the company was a pleasure to behold. The richly varied hues of the assembly in a church or theatre are said to have more than once proved too distracting for our greatest teachers and actors, but most ravishing of all is said to have been the unspeakable magnificence of a military review. The sight of a line of battle of twenty thousand isosceles suddenly facing about and exchanging the somber black of their bases for the or orange and purple of the two sides including their acute angle the militia of the equilateral triangles tricolored in red white and blue the mauve ultramarine gamboge and burnt umber of the square artillerymen rapidly rotating near their vermilion guns, the dashing and flashing of the five-colored and six-colored pentagons and hexagons careering across the field in their offices of surgeons, geometricians, and aides-de-camp, all these may well have been sufficient to render credible the famous story how an illustrious circle, overcome by the artistic beauty of the forces under his command, threw aside his marshal's baton and his royal crown, exclaiming that he henceforth exchange them for the artist's pencil. How great and glorious the sensuous development of these days must have been is in part indicated by the very language and vocabulary of the period. The commonest utterances of the commonest citizens in the time of the color revolt seem to have been suffused with a richer tinge of word or thought, and to that era we are even now indebted for our finest poetry and for whatever rhythm still remains in the more scientific utterance of these modern days. Section 9 of the Universal Color Bill But meanwhile, the intellectual arts were fast decaying. 
the art of sight recognition being no longer needed was no longer practiced and the studies of geometry statics kinetics and other kindred subjects came soon to be considered superfluous and fell into disrespect and neglect even at our university the inferior art of feeling speedily experienced the same fate at our elementary schools then the isosceles classes asserting that the specimens were no longer used nor needed and refusing to pay the customary tribute from the criminal classes to the service of education wax daily more numerous and more insolent on the strength of their immunity from the old burden which had formerly exercised the twofold wholesome effect of at once taming their brutal nature and thinning their excessive numbers year by year the soldiers and artisans began more vehemently to assert and with increasing truth that there was no great difference between them and the very highest class of polygons now that they were raised to an equality with the latter and enabled to grapple with all the difficulties and solve all the problems of life whether statical or kinetical by the simple process of color recognition not content with the natural neglect into which sight recognition was falling they began boldly to demand the legal prohibition of all monopolizing and aristocratic arts and the consequent abolition of all endowments for the studies of sight recognition mathematics and feeling soon they began to insist that inasmuch as color which was a second nature had destroyed the need of aristocratic distinctions the law should follow in the same path and that henceforth all individuals in all classes should be recognized as absolutely equal and entitled to equal rights finding the higher orders wavering and undecided the leaders of the revolution advanced still further in their requirements and at last demanded that all classes alike the priests and the women not accepted should do homage to color by submitting to be painted when it was objected that priests and women had no sides they retorted that nature and expediency concurred in dictating that the front half of every human being, that is to say the half containing his eye and mouth, should be distinguishable from his hinder half. They therefore brought before a general and extraordinary assembly of all the states of Flatland a bill proposing that in every woman the half containing the eye and mouth should be colored red and the other half green. The priests were to be painted the same way, red being applied to the semicircle in which the eye and mouth formed the middle point, while the other or hinder semicircle was to be colored green. There was no little cunning in this proposal, which indeed emanated not from any isosceles, for no being so degraded would have had angularity enough to appreciate, much less to devise, such a model of statecraft, but from an irregular circle who, instead of being destroyed in his childhood, was reserved by a foolish indulgence to bring desolation on his country and destruction on myriads of his followers. On the one hand, the proposition was calculated to bring the women in all classes over to the side of the chromatic innovation, for by assigning to the women the same two colors as were assigned to the priests, the revolutionists thereby ensured that, in certain positions, Every woman would appear like a priest and be treated with corresponding respect and deference, a prospect that could not fail to attract the female sex en masse. But by some of my readers, the possibility of the identical appearance of priests and women under the new legislation may not be recognized. If so, a word or two will make it obvious. Imagine a woman duly decorated, according to the new code, with the front half, i.e. the half containing eye and mouth, red, and with the hinder half green. Look at her from one side. Obviously you will see a straight line, half red, half green. Now imagine a priest, whose mouth is at one side and who, whose front semicircle is consequently colored red, while his hinder semicircle is green, so that the diameter AB divides the green from the red. If you contemplate the great man so as to have your eye in the same straight line as his dividing diameter, what you will see will be a straight line of which one half will be red and the other green. The whole line will be rather shorter perhaps than that of a full-sized woman and will shade off more rapidly towards its, its extremities, but the identity of the colors would give you an immediate impression of identity of class, making you neglectful of other details. Bear in mind the decay of sight recognition which threatened society at the time of the color revolt. Add to the certainty that women would speedily learn to shade off their extremities so as to imitate the circles. It must then be surely obvious to you, my dear reader, that the color bill placed us under a great danger of confounding a priest with a young woman. 
How attractive this prospect must have been to the frail sex may readily be imagined. They anticipated with delight the confusion that would ensue. At home, they might hear political and ecclesiastical secrets intended not for them, but for their husbands and brothers, and might even issue commands in the name of a priestly circle. Out of doors, the striking combination of red and green without addition of any other colors would be sure to lead the common people into endless mistakes, and the women would gain whatever the circles lost in the deference of the passers-by. As for the scandal that would befall the circular class if the frivolous and unseemly conduct of the women were imputed to them, and as to the consequent subversion of the Constitution, the female sex could not be expected to give a thought to these considerations. Even in the households of the circles, the women were all in favor of the universal color bill. The second object aimed at by the bill was the gradual demoralization of the circles themselves. In the general intellectual decay, they still preserve their pristine clearness and strength of understanding. From their earliest childhood, familiarized in their circular households with the total absence of color, the nobles alone preserve the sacred art of sight recognition with all the advantages that result from the admirable training of that intellect. Hence, up to the date of the introduction of the universal color bill, the circles had not only held their own, but even increased their lead of the other classes by abstinence from the popular fashion. Now, therefore, the artful irregular whom I described above as the real author of this diabolical bill determined at one blow to lower the status of the hierarchy by forcing them to submit to the pollution of color, and at the same time to destroy their domestic opportunities of training in the art of sight recognition so as to enfeeble their intellects by depriving them of their pure and colorless homes. Once subjected to the chromatic taint, every parental and every childish circle would demoralize each other. Only in discerning between the father and the mother would the circular infant find problems for the exercise of its understanding, problems too often likely to be corrupted by maternal impostures with the result of shaking the child's faith in all logical conclusions. Thus, by degrees, the intellectual luster of the priestly order would wane, and the road would then lie open for a total destruction of all aristocratic legislature and for the subversion of our privileged classes. Section 10 of the Suppression of the Chromatic Sedition The agitation for the Universal Color Bill continued for three years, and up to the last moment of that period, it seemed as though anarchy were destined to triumph. A whole army of polygons who turned out to fight as private soldiers was utterly annihilated by a superior force of isosceles triangles, the squares and pentagons meanwhile remaining neutral. Worse than all, some of the ablest circles fell a prey to conjugal fury. Infuriated by political animosity, the wives in many a noble household wearied their lords with prayers to give up their opposition to the color bill, and some, finding their entreaties fruitless, fell on and slaughtered their innocent children and husband, perishing themselves in the act of carnage. It is recorded that during the triennial agitation no less than twenty-three circles perished in domestic discord. Great indeed was the peril. It seemed as though the priests had no choice between submission and extermination when suddenly the course of events was completely changed by one of those picturesque incidents which statesmen ought never to neglect, often to anticipate, and sometimes perhaps to originate, because of the absurdly disproportionate power with which they appealed to the sympathies of the populace. It happened. The nisosceles of a low type, with a brain little, if at all, above four degrees, accidentally dabbling in the colors of some tradesman whose shop he had plundered, painted himself, or caused himself to be painted, for the story varies, with the twelve colors of a dodecagon. Going into the marketplace, he accosted in a feigned voice a maiden, the orphan daughter of a noble polygon, whose affection in former days he had sought in vain, and by a series of deceptions, aided on the one side by a string of lucky accidents too long to relate, and on the other by an almost inconceivable fatuity and neglect of ordinary precautions on the part of the relations of the bride, he succeeded in consummating the marriage. The unhappy girl committed suicide on discovering the fraud to which she had been subjected. When the news of this catastrophe spread from state to state, the minds of the women were violently agitated. Sympathy with the miserable victim and the anticipations of similar deceptions for themselves, their sisters, and their daughters made them now regard the color bill in an entirely new aspect. 
not a few openly avowed themselves converted to antagonism. The rest needed only a slight stimulus to make a similar avowal. Seizing this favorable opportunity, the circles hastily convened an extraordinary assembly of the states, and besides the usual guard of convicts, they secured the attendance of a large number of reactionary women. Amidst an unprecedented concourse, the chief circle of those days, by name Pentacyclus, arose to find himself hissed and hooted by a hundred and twenty thousand isosceles. But he secured silence by declaring that henceforth the circles would enter on a policy of concession. Yielding to the wishes of the majority, they would accept the color bill. The uproar being at once converted to applause, he invited Chromatiste, the leader of the sedition, into the center of the hall to receive, in the name of his followers, the submission of the hierarchy. Then followed a speech, a masterpiece of rhetoric which occupied nearly a day in the delivery and to which no summary can do justice. With a grave appearance of impartiality, he declared that, as they were now finally committing themselves to reform or innovation, it was desirable that they should take one last view of the perimeter of the whole subject, its defects, as well as its advantages. Gradually introducing the mention of the dangers to the tradesmen, the professional classes, and the gentlemen, he silenced the rising murmurs of the isosceles by reminding them that, in spite of all these defects, he was willing to accept the bill if it was approved by the majority. But it was manifest that all except the isosceles were moved by his words and were either neutral or averse to the bill. Turning now to the workmen, he asserted that their interests must not be neglected and that, if they intended to accept the color bill, they ought at least to do so with full view of the consequences. Many of them, he said, were on the point of being admitted to the class of the regular triangles. Others anticipated for their children a distinction they could not hope for themselves. The honorable ambition would now have to be sacrificed. With the, adoption of, with the universal adoption of color, all distinctions would cease. Regularity would be confused with irregularity. Development would give place to retrogression. The workmen would, in a few generations, be degraded to the level of the military or even the convict class. Political power would be in the hands of the greatest number, that is to say, the criminal classes, who were already more numerous than the workmen, and would soon outnumber all the other classes put together when the usual comp compensative laws of nature were violated. A subdued murmur of assent ran through the ranks of the artisans and chromatistes, and alarm attempted to step forward and address them. But he found himself encompassed with guards, and forced to remain silent, while the chief circle in a few impassioned words made a final appeal to the women, exclaiming that, if the color bill passed, no marriage would henceforth be safe, no woman's honor secure. Fraud, deception, hypocrisy would pervade every household, domestic bliss would share the fate of the Constitution, and past a speedy perdition, sooner than this, he cried, come death. At these words, which were preconcerted, which were the preconcerted signal for action, the isosceles convicts fell on and transfixed the wretched chromatistes. The regular classes, opening their ranks, made way for a band of women who, under direction of the circles, moved back foremost, invisibly and unerringly, on the unconscious soldiers. The artisans, imitating the example of their betters, also opened their ranks. Meantime, bands of convicts occupied every entrance with an impenetrable phalanx. The battle, or rather carnage, was of short duration. Under the skillful generalship of the circles, almost every woman's charge was fatal, and very many extracted their sting uninjured, ready for a second slaughter. But no second blow was needed. The rabble of the isosceles did the rest of the business for themselves, surprised, leaderless, attacked in front by invisible foes, and finding egress cut off by the convicts behind them, they at once, after their manner, lost all presence of mind and raised the cry of treachery. This sealed their fate. Every isosceles now saw and felt a foe in every other in half an hour, not one of that vast multitude was living and the fragment of seven score thousand of the criminal class slain by one another's angles attested the triumph of the order. The circles delayed not to push their victory to the uttermost. The working men they spared but decimated. 
The militia of the equilaterals was at once called out, and every triangle suspected of irregularity on reasonable grounds was destroyed by court-martial without the formality of exact measurement by the social board. The homes of the military and artisan classes were inspected in the course of visitations and extending through upwards of a year, and during that period every town, village, and hamlet was systematically purged of that excess of the lower orders which had been brought about by the neglect to pay the tribute of criminals to the schools and university, and by the violation of the other natural laws of the constitution of Flatland. Thus, the balance of classes was again restored. Needless to say that henceforth the use of color was abolished, and its possession, possession prohibited. Even the utterance of any word denoting color except by the circles or by qualified scientific teachers was punished by a severe penalty. Only at our university and some of the very highest and most esoteric classes which I myself have never been privileged to attend, it is understood that the sparing use of color is still sanctioned for the purpose of illustrating some of the deeper problems of mathematics, but of this I can only speak from hearsay. Everywhere in Flatland, color is now non-existent. The art of making it is known to only one living person, the chief circle for the time being, and by him it is handed down on his deathbed to none but his successor. One manufactory alone produces it, and, lest the secret should be betrayed, the workmen are annually consumed and fresh ones introduced. So great is the terror with which even now our aristocracy looks back to the far distant days of the agitation for the universal color bill. Section 11. Concerning our priests. It is high time that I should pass from these brief and discursive notes about my things in Flatland to the central event of this book, my initiation to the mysteries of space. That is my subject. All that has gone before is merely preface. For this reason, I must omit many matters of which the explanation would not, I flatter myself, be without interest to my readers, as, for example, our method of propelling and stopping ourselves, although destitute of feet the means by which we give fixity to structures of wood, stone, or brick, although of course we have no hands, nor can we lay foundations as you can, nor avail ourselves of the lateral pressure of the earth, the manner in which the rain originates in the intervals between our various zones, so that the northern regions do not intercept the moisture falling from, the, from falling on the southern, the nature of our hills and mines, our trees and vegetables, our seasons and harvests, our alphabet, and method of writing adapted to our linear tablets, these and a hundred other details of our physical existence I must pass over, nor do I mention them now, except to indicate to my readers that their omission proceeds not from forgetfulness on the part of the author, but from his regard for the time of the reader. Yet before I proceed to my legitimate subject, some few final remarks will no doubt be expected by my readers upon those pillars and mainstays of the constitution of Flatland, the controllers of our conduct and shapers of our destiny, the objects of universal homage and almost of adoration, need I say that I mean our circles or priests. When I call them priests, let me not be understood as meaning no more than the term denotes with you. With us, our priests are administrators of all business, art, and science, directors of trade, commerce, generalship, architecture, engineering, education, statesmanship, legislature, morality, theology, doing nothing themselves. They are the causes of everything worth doing that is done by others. Although popularly everyone called a circle is deemed a circle, yet among the better educated, educated classes it is known that no circle is really a circle, but only a polygon with a very large number of very small sides. As the number of the sides increases, a polygon approximates to a circle, and when the number is very great indeed, say for example three or four hundred, it is extremely difficult for the most delicate touch to feel any polygonal angles. Let me say rather, it would be difficult, for, as I have shown above, recognition by feeling is unknown amongst the highest society, and to feel a circle would be considered a most audacious insult. 
This habit of abstention from feeling in the best society enables a circle the more easily to sustain the veil of mystery in which, from his earliest years, he is wont to enwrap the exact nature of his perimeter or circumference. Three feet being the average perimeter, it follows that, in a polygon of three hundred sides, each side will be no more than the hundredth part of a foot in length, or little more than the tenth part of an inch. And in a polygon of six or seven hundred sides, the sides are little larger than the diameter of a spaceland pinhead. It is always assumed by courtesy that the chief circle for the time being has ten thousand sides. The ascent of the posterity of the circles in the regular social scale is, not, scale is not restricted, as it is among the lower regular classes by the law of nature which limits the increase of sides to one in each generation. If it were so, the number of sides in a circle would be a mere question of pedigree and arithmetic, and the 497th descendant of an equilateral triangle would necessarily be a polygon with 500 sides, but this is not the case. Nature's law describes two antagonistic decrees affecting circular propagation. First, that as the race climbs higher in the scale of development, so development shall proceed at an accelerated pace. Second, that in the same proportion the race shall become less fertile. Consequently, in the home of a polygon of four or five hundred sides, it is rare to find a sun. More than one is, is never seen. On the other hand, the son of a 500-sided polygon has been known to possess 550 or even, five, or even 600 sides. Art also steps in to help the process of the higher evolution. Our physicians have discovered that the small and tender sides of an infant polygon of the higher class can be fractured, and his whole frame reset with such exactness that a polygon of two or three hundred sides sometimes, by no means always, for the process is attended with serious risk, but sometimes overleaps two or three hundred generations, and as it were doubles at a stroke, the number of his progenitors and the nobility of his descent. Many a promising child is sacrificed in this way. Scarcely one out of ten survives. Yet, so strong is a parental ambition among those polygons who are, as it were, on the fringe of the circular class, that it is very rare to find a nobleman of that position in society who has neglected to place his firstborn in the circular neotherapeutic gymnasium before he has attended the age of a month. One year determines success or failure. At the end of that time, the child has, in all probability, added one more to the tombstones that crowd the neotherapeutic the cemetery, but on rare occasions, a glad procession bears back the little one to his exultant parents, no longer a polygon, but a circle, at least by courtesy, and a single instance of so blessed a result induces multitudes of polygonal parents to submit to similar domestic sacrifices which have a dissimilar issue. Section 12 of the Doctrine of Our Priests As to the doctrine of the circles, it may briefly be summed up in a single maxim. Attend to your configuration. Whether political, ecclesiastical, or moral, all their teaching has for its object the improvement of individual and collective configuration, with special reference, of course, to the configuration of the circles to which all other objects are subordinated. It is the merit of the circles that they have effectively suppressed those ancient heresies which led men to waste energy and sympathy in the vain belief that conduct, de conduct depends upon will, effort, training, encouragement, praise, or anything else but configuration. It was Pantacyclus, the illustrious circle mentioned above as the queller of the color revolt, who first convinced mankind that configuration makes the man, that if, for example, you are born an isosceles with two uneven sides, you will assuredly go wrong unless you have them made even, for which purpose you must go to the isosceles hospital. Similarly, if you are a triangle or square or even a polygon born with any irregularity, you must be taken to one of the regular hospitals to have your disease cured. Otherwise, you will end your days in the state prison or by the angle of the state executioner. All faults or defects, from the slightest misconduct to the most flagitious crime, Pantacyclus attributed to some deviation from perfect regularity in the bodily figure, caused perhaps, if not congenital, by some collision in a crowd, by neglect to take exercise, or by taking too much of it, or even by a sudden change of temper temperatures resulting in a shrinkage or expansion in some too susceptible part of the frame. Therefore concluded that illustrious philosopher, 
neither good conduct nor bad conduct is a fit subject in any sober estimation for either praise or blame. For why should you praise, for example, the integrity of a square who faithfully defends the interest of his client, when you ought in reality rather to admire the exact precision of his right angles? Or again, why blame a lying, thievish isosceles when you ought rather to deplore the incurable inequality of his sides? Theoretically, this doctrine is unquestionable, but it has practical drawbacks. In dealing with an isosceles, if a, if a rascal pleads that he cannot help stealing because of his unevenness, you reply that for that very reason, because he cannot help being a nuisance to his neighbors, you, the magistrate, cannot help sentencing him to be consumed, and there's an end of the matter. But in little domestic difficulties, where the penalty of consumption or death is out of the question, this theory of configuration sometimes comes in awkwardly. And I must confess that occasionally when one of my own hexagonal grandsons pleads as an excuse for his disobedience that a sudden change of the temperature has been too much for his perimeter, and that I ought to lay the blame not on him but on his configuration which can only be strengthened by abundance of the choicest sweetmeats, I neither see my way logically to reject nor practically to accept his conclusions. For my own part, I find it best to assume that a good sound scolding or castigation has some latent or strengthening influence on my grandson's configuration. Though I own that I have no grounds for thinking so, at all events, I am not alone in my way of extricating myself from this dilemma, for I find that many of the highest circles, sitting as judges in law courts, use praise and blame towards regular and irregular figures, and in their homes I know by experience that when scolding their children they speak about right or wrong as vehemently and passionately as if they believed that these names represented real existences and that a human figure is really capable of choosing between them. Constantly carrying out their policy of making configuration the leading idea in every mind, the circles reverse the nature of that commandment which in Spaceland regulates the relations between parents and children. With you, children are taught to honor their parents. With us, next to the circles, who are the chief object of universal homage, a man is taught to honor his grandson. If he has one, or if not, his son. By honor, however, is by no means meant indulgence, but a reverent regard for their highest interest. And the circles teach th that the duty of fathers is to subordinate their own interests to those of posterity, thereby advancing the welfare of the whole state as well as that of their own immediate descendants. The weak point in the system of the circles, if a humble square may speak to venture may venture to speak of anything circular as containing any element of weakness, appears to me to be found in their relations with women. As it is of the utmost importance for society that irregular births should be discouraged, it follows that no woman who has any irregularities in her ancestry is a fit partner for one who desires that his posterity should rise by regular degrees in the social scale. Now the irregularity of a male is a matter of measurement, but as all women are straight and therefore visibly regular, so to speak, one has to devise some other means of ascertaining what I may call their invisible irregularity. That is to say, their potential irregularities as regards possible offspring. This is effected by carefully kept pedigrees which are preserved and supervised by the state, and without a certified pedigree no woman is allowed to marry. Now. It might have been supposed that a circle, proud of his ancestry and regard regardful for a posterity which might possibly issue hereafter in a chief circle, would be more careful than any other to choose a wife who had no blot on her escutcheon, but it is not so. The care in choosing a regular wife appears to diminish as one rises in the social scale. Nothing would induce an aspiring isosceles who had hopes of generating an equilateral son to take a wife who reckoned a single in irregularity among her ancestors. A square or a pentagon who is confident that his family is steadily on the rise does not inquire above the 500th generation. A hexagon or dodecagon is even more careless of the wife's pedigree, but a circle has been known to deliberately take a wife who has had an irregular great-grandfather and all because of some slight superiority of luster or because of the charms of a low voice, which, with us even more than with you, is thought an excellent thing in a woman. Such ill-judged marriages are, as might be expected, barren if they do not result in positive irregularity or in diminution of sides, but none of these evils have hitherto proved sufficiently deterrent. 
The loss of a few sides in a highly developed pe polygon is not easily noticed and is sometimes compensated by a successful operation in the neotherapeutic gymnasium as I have described above. And the circles are too much disposed to acquiesce in infecundity as a law of the superior development. Yet if the evil not be arrested, the gradual diminution of the circular classes may soon become more rapid and the time may not be far distant when the race, being no longer able to produce a chief circle, the constitution of Flatland must fall. One other word of warning suggests itself to me, though I cannot so easily mention a remedy, and this also refers to our relations with women. About three hundred years ago, it was decreed by the chief circle that since women are deficient in reason, but abundant in emotion, they ought no longer to be treated as rational, nor receive any mental education. The consequence was that they were no longer taught to read, nor even to master arithmetic, enough to enable them to count the angles of their husband or children, and hence they sensibly declined during each generation in intellectual power. And this system of female non-education or quietism still prevails. My fear is that, with the best intentions, this policy has been carried on so far as to react injuriously on the male sex. For the consequence is that, as things now are, we males have to lead a kind of bilingual, and I may also say, bimental existence. With women we speak of love, duty, right, wrong, pity, hope, and other irrational and emotional conceptions. We have no existence, which have no existence, and the fiction of which has no object except to control feminine exuberances. But among ourselves, and in our books, we have an entirely different vocabulary, and I may almost say, idiom. Love then becomes the anticipation of benefits. Duty becomes necessity or fitness, and other words are correspondingly transmuted. Moreover, among women we use language implying the utmost deference for their sex, and they fully believe that the chief circle himself is not more devoutly adored by us than they are, but behind our backs they are both regarded and spoken of by all except the very young as being little better than mindless organisms. Our theology also in the women's chamber is entirely different from our theology elsewhere. Now, my humble fear is that this double training in language as well as in thought imposes somewhat too heavy a burden upon the young, especially when, at the age of three years old, they are taken from the maternal care and taught to, to unlearn the old language, except for the purpose of repeating it in the presence of their mothers and nurses, and to learn the vocabulary and idiom of science. Already, methinks, I discern a weakness in the grasp of mathematical truth at the present time as compared with the more robust intellect of our ancestors three hundred years ago. I say nothing of the possible danger if a woman should ever surreptitiously learn to read and convey to her sex the result of her perusal of a singular popular volume, nor of the possibility that the indiscretion or disobedience of some infant male might reveal to a mother the secrets of the logical dialect. On the simple ground of the enfeebling of the male intellect, I rest this humble appeal to the highest authorities to reconsider the regulations of female education. Part 2. Other Worlds Oh, brave new worlds that have such people in them. Section 13. How I Had a Vision of Lineland it was the last day but one of the 1,999th year of our era, and my first day of the long vacation. Excuse me. Having amused myself till a late hour with my favorite recreation of geometry, I had retired to rest with an unsolved problem in my mind. In the night, I had a dream. I saw before me a vast multitude of small, straight lines, which I naturally assumed to be women, interspersed with other beings still smaller and of the nature of lustrous points, all moving to and fro in one and the same straight line, and as nearly as I could judge with the same velocity. A noise of confused, multitudinous chirping or twittering issued from them at intervals as long as they were moving, but sometimes they ceased from motion and then all was silence. Approaching one of the largest of what I thought to be women, I accosted her, but received no answer. A second and third appeal on my part were equally ineffectual, losing patience at what appeared to me intolerable rudeness. I brought my mouth into position full in front of her mouth so as to intercept her motion and loudly repeated my question, Woman! 
what signifies this concourse and this strange and confused chirping and this monotonous motion to and fro in one and the same straight line? I am no woman, replied the small line. I am the monarch of the world. But thou, whence intrudest thou into my realm of Lineland? Receiving this abrupt reply, I begged pardon if I had in any way startled or molested his royal highness, and describing myself as a stranger, I besought the king to give me some account of his dominions. But I had the greatest possible difficulty in obtaining any information on points that really interest me, for the monarch could not refrain from constantly assuming that whatever was familiar to him must also be known to me, and that I was simulating ignorance in jest. However, by persevering questions, I elicited the following facts. It seemed that this poor ignorant monarch, as he called himself, was persuaded that the straight line which he called his kingdom, and in which he passed his existence, constituted the whole of the world, and indeed the whole of space. Not being able either to move or to see, save in his straight line, he had no conception of anything out of it. Though he had heard my voice when I first addressed him, the sounds had come to him in a manner so contrary to his experience that he had made no answer, seeing no man, as he expressed it, and hearing a voice as it were from my own intestines. Until the moment when I placed my mouth in his world, he had neither seen me nor heard anything except confused sounds beating against what I called his side, but what he called his inside or stomach. Nor had he even now the least conception of the region from which I had come. Outside his world or line, all was blank to him. Nay, not even a blank, for blank implies space. Say rather, all was non-existent. His subjects, of whom the small lines were men and the points women, were all alike confined in motion and eyesight to that single straight line which was their world. It need scarcely be added that the whole of their horizon was limited to a point, nor could any one ever see anything but a point. Men, woman, child, thing, each was a point to the eye of a linelander. Only by the sound of the voice could sex or age be distinguished. Moreover, as each individual occupied the whole of the narrow path, so to speak, which constituted his universe, and no one could move to the right or left to make way for passers-by, it followed that no linelander could ever pass another. Once neighbors, always neighbors. Neighborhood with them was like marriage with us. Neighbors remained neighbors till death did them part. Such a life, with all vision limited to a point and all motion to a straight line, seemed to me inexpressibly dreary, and I was surprised to note the vivacity and cheerfulness of the king. Wondering whether it was possible, amid circumstances so unfavorable to domestic relations, to enjoy the pleasures of the conjugal union, I hesitated for some time to question his royal highness on so delicate a subject, but at last I plunged into it by abruptly inquiring as to the health of his family. "'My wives and children?' he replied, are all well and happy. Staggered at this answer, for in the immediate proximity of the monarch, as I had noted in my dream before I entered Lineland, there were none but men. I ventured to reply, pardon me, but I cannot imagine how your royal highness can at any time either see or approach their majesties when there are at least half a dozen intervening individuals whom you can neither see, nor, uh, see through nor pass by. Is it possible that in Lineland proximity is not necessary for marriage and for the generation of children? How can you ask so absurd a question? replied the monarch. If it were indeed as you suggest, the universe would soon be depopulated. No, no. Neighborhood is needless for the union of the hearts, and the birth of children is too important a matter to have been allowed to depend upon such an accident as proximity. You cannot be ignorant of this, yet... Since you are pleased to affect ignorance, I will instruct you as if you were the veriest baby in Lineland. Know, then, that marriages are consummated by means of the faculty of sound and the sense of hearing. You are, of course, aware that every man has two mouths or voices, as well as two eyes, a base at one and a tenor at the other of his extremities. I should not mention this, but that I have been unable to distinguish your tenor in the course of our conversation." I replied that I had but one voice, and that I had not been aware that his royal highness had two. That confirms my impression, said the king, that you are not a man, but a feminine monstrosity with a bass voice and an utterly uneducated ear. But, to continue, nature having herself ordained that every man should wed two wives, why two, asked I, you carry your affected simplicity too, oh, you carry your affected simplicity too far, he cried. 
How can there be a completely harmonious union without the combination of the four in one, viz. the bass and tenor of the man with the soprano and contralto of the two women? But supposing, said I, that a man should prefer one wife or three, it is impossible, he said. It is as inconceivable as that two and one should make five, or that the human eye should see a straight line. I would have interrupted him, but he proceeded as follows. Once in the middle of each, each week, a law of nature compels us to move to and fro with a rhythmic motion of more than usual violence, which continues for the time you would take to count a hundred and one. In the midst of this choral dance at the 51st pulsation, the inhabitants of the universe pause in full career, and each individual sends forth his richest, fullest, sweetest strain. It is in this decisive moment that all our marriages are made. So exquisite is the adaptation of bass to treble, of tenor to contralto, that oftentimes the loved ones, though twenty thousand leagues away, recognize at once the responsive note of their destined lover, and, penetrating the paltry obstacles of distance, love unites the three. The marriage in that instance consummated results in a threefold male and female offspring which takes its place in Lineland. What? Always threefold, said I. Must one wife then always have twins? Base voiced monstrosity, yes, replied the king. How else could the balance of the sexes be maintained if two girls were not born for every boy? Would you ignore the very alphabet of nature? He ceased, speechless for fury, and some time elapsed before I could induce him to resume his narrative. You will not, of course, suppose that every bachelor among us finds his mates at the first meet, first wooing in the universal marriage chorus. On the contrary, the process is by most of us many times repeated. Few are the hearts whose happy lot it is at once to recognize in each other's voices the partner intended for them by providence and to fly into a reciprocal and perfectly harmonious embrace. With most of us, the courtship is of a long duration. The wooer's voices may perhaps accord with one of the future wives, but not with both, or not at first with either, and, or the soprano and contralto may not quite harmonize. In such cases, nature has provided that every weekly chorus shall bring the three lovers into closer harmony. Each trial of voice, each fresh discovery of discord, almost imperceptibly induces a less perfect to modify his or her vocal utterance so as to approximate to the more perfect and after many trials and many approximations the result is at last achieved there comes a day at last when while the wanted marriage chorus goes forth from universal lineland the three far-off lovers suddenly find themselves in exact harmony and before they are awake the wedded triplet is wrapped vocally into a duplicate embrace, and nature rejoices over one more marriage and over three more births. And I think, given the time, that's a good place to leave off so that we will finish up Flatland on Thursday, and then we will start a new book next Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope you have a good rest of your weekend and a good night, and I hope you will join me on Thursday as we continue Flatland. Good night.